All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully, we'll have a couple more people joining us later. If you see them pop into a room and it says admit, just let me know because I might not be able to see the pop up immediately while I'm screen, sharing out my screen. Um, hopefully, it's just letting folks write in. I think that's what it's doing now. All right, so welcome to iTech 325, Systems Administration and Maintenance. I'm going to be your instructor over the next couple of weeks. Uh, my name is Willie Sanders. I go by Will, um, Professor Sanders. <laughs> um, and I'm going to be guiding you through this program. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, just kind of brief introduction. I'm a IT professional. By trade, I've been in the field for over 17 years. I served in a bunch of different capacities. I've been on the software side, uh, networking systems administration, of course, desk side support. Um, so I got a chance to get uh, my hands dirty on a lot of different technologies. So hopefully I'll be able to share from uh, some of my experience with you guys as we're going through this class. A um, <clears throat> Couple of my roles, of course, currently I'm a professor here at Towson. I also teach at University of Maryland's uh, global campus. Um, I'm a former network administrator for a company called Opus Inspection. They're a international company out of Norway. They uh, basically, they're the biggest vehicle testing organization in the world. And they have a bunch of subsidiaries around the world. And one of them is here in, here in the States called EnviroTest. And they run all of the vehicle testing services for most of the country, including Maryland's VHIP program. So my role with them is I, I um, maintain the network for all of the VHIP, the vehicle emissions and inspection program sites around the state. Um, <clears throat> did that on a consultant's basis. I'm also a former senior systems analyst and senior systems administrator for Pearson. I'm sure you heard of Pearson there, the largest education company in the world. Pretty much any standardized test that you've ever taken or technical book or like probably nine out of 10 of the technical books that you've written uh, read rather classes, they might have had materials from Pearson. They're huge. So I worked on their global team on a couple of different roles, as I mentioned before, senior systems analyst, uh, senior, uh, senior systems administrator, and a mobile device security manager. Um, and then I had a couple, uh, several other roles in IT. Currently, again, I am focusing on academics. I still do consultant, no, IT consulting and uh, security consulting. Um, but outside of uh, academia, I'm also the founder and executive director of a nonprofit called Pass It On. Uh, it's an IT training organization based in Baltimore whose mission is to close the technology skills gap for disadvantaged youth and adults. So uh, we do that by partnering with other community organizations, hospital systems, police departments to provide technical training to help people get roles in IT. On the academic side, I'm in school just like you guys. I'm finishing up my doctorate at Capital Technology University. I'm a doctor's going to be in cybersecurity, and I hope to be done that in May uh, when I finish my dissertation. Um, I'm a husband, a father, and a lifelong learner. That's my beautiful family there. They're the reasons I study up and keep uh, pushing to get better at what I do. So a little bit about the course. In iTech 325, uh, you're going to learn all the ins and outs of what it means to be a systems administrator. And you're gonna see that's kind of a complex web to follow as we go through this presentation today. It's not as straightforward as you might, might originally have thought, but the good news about it is you're gonna, there's gonna be a need for you, you or someone with your skill set in any industry that you enter into. Virtually all organizations, have information technologies which require ongoing administration and maintenance. Uh, in this course, students, <clears throat> uh, this course provides students with the essentials for effective administration and maintenance of applications, operating systems, and networks, including IT system documentation, policies, and procedures, and the education and support of users of these systems. Our objectives for this course are gonna to be to learn how to install and configure at least one current server operating system. You guys are 
actually going to get the opportunity to look at two um, before the end of the class uh, and install them and configure them. You're going to distinguish between server and client services, install and configure at least one uh, current application. And this will be like an enterprise class application, um, which you'll see is going to be a little bit different than the click, 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 next, next, next that you might be accustomed to on a desktop or a laptop computer. You're going to describe the importance of application maintenance for organization. Identify situations in which administrative activities are required. Identify situations which interfere with administrative activities, sort of like the one we had this morning for those of you who had day classes. Uh, was anybody on this morning or this afternoon when uh, Zoom and everything else crashed? <laughs> yes. Yes. Same I, crash I, yeah, I had a I had a twelve thirty. This same class I teach at twelve thirty, uh, twelve thirty to one forty five um, section of it, and I'm going to log in at like twelve fifteen, and just uh, Zoom is just circling. <laughs> I launch it from like three different browsers, multiple devices. It's just circling. I'm thinking it's me, but after testing it, was able to you know, uh, narrow it down to not being anything on my home network or on my any of my devices. And then once we were finally able to get into class, other students were like, oh, yeah, yeah, I had that issue too. So Zoom and a lot of other Towson systems were unresponsive and unavailable for at least 15 to 20 minutes in the middle of the day. I think it got overloaded because everybody working from home and logging in, you know, this, this we're still in the first days back. And so you got a whole bunch of extra um, folks on a network who aren't typically because aren't typically logged in remote like this. And then you guys are some of you guys are back on campus, too, right? Not Anybody? me. Not you. I know they I've been seeing the, uh, the emails there, folks moving back in on campus. So that could have played a role, too, um, because this time last last semester, the, the buildings were still closed. So everybody was remote. They were using their home own home networks to access these resources. Now you got a whole bunch of extra folks on your network trying to all trying to access the resources at the same time, these network resources and system resources at the same time. So I think it put a little bit of pressure on it or something else could have crashed in the back end. That's not my job for Towson. <laughs> I'll let somebody else fight that fire. But as a, as a systems administrator, if if you were the system administrator for Towson, you had a rough morning this morning or rough afternoon, rather. All right. But that's just one of the many duties that a sysadmin uh, gets to tackle. And you'll learn kind of the ins and outs of that. Determine the need for documentation, policies and procedures for IT systems and describe education and support for users of IT systems and policies. For our textbook. We're going to be utilizing Unix and Linux Systems Administration Handbook. But that won't be the only resource that we're using for two reasons. One, it's kind of dated. I'm kind of I'm trying to get the, the college to move away from that textbook or at least get one that was written, uh, you know, in uh, near closer to the end of the decade <laughs> of that decade. Um, and also, this isn't a Unix or Linux class to be well rounded. Uh, as a systems administrator, you need to tackle more than just a single operating system. You need a broader base of exposure. Um, you need to learn about some other technologies. So we'll we'll be I'll be introducing some different texts in the form of white papers and blog posts, um, tech articles, so that uh, you guys can get some some uh, information from different sources that aren't just Unix Linux specific. But I still encourage you to get the, the book, either an electronic copy or a print copy, because a, a book like this is always still a good reference to have, a desk reference. Every IT professional should have a library of technical books that they can use as desk references because of the books, they are researched. People put you know years of research into coming up with those texts. So the depth of knowledge is a little bit deeper than what you're going to get on a blog post. So if you run into a real hard issue, sometimes the internet won't be able to.
Professor, are you still there? Yeah, I lost audio as well. Did Zoom crash? Uh, I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> Concerning you, you literally just mentioned it. Yeah, that would be funny if it did. But, yeah. Professor, uh, is your audio still working? He might have just lagged out or something. Uh, I mean, five o'clock is probably another high traffic time, too. But, yeah, oh, he no, got it's just him. If he doesn't get back on in 15 minutes, are we legally allowed to leave? I mean, yeah, you're legally allowed to leave right now. Refresh is not here. Fair, fair point. Fair point. I would just take a screenshot or something for proof. No, is everyone day going well? It's all right. You been going good? Nice, nice. Um, Yo, he has really so, good views. Okay. Someone said something, but their mic just muffled everything. I think that was John. Jordan, I said he has really good reviews on Rate My Professor. Yeah, I saw that too. Yeah. Sorry, Jordan. That's how I choose all my professors. I, I check there first. Yeah, do more research on Rate My Professor than actual schoolwork. And also leave reviews because that helps other people. Hell yeah. 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 All right, y'all. So since the professor's not here, I guess, you know, we can just go over systems, administration, and maintenance. So Anybody any, PowerPoint? Has, has anyone ever maintained a system or done something systems administration? Nope. Nope. Nice. Okay, nice, nice. All right. Nope. Well, that's the class for today. Everyone have a good day. You all good days, all right? I'm dead. Jordan? You, you was up. Do we have any homework? Um, yeah. Five-page paper. All right. I think he's coming back. Uh, sorry about that. My uh, my internet connection dropped. What was the last thing you guys remember hearing? I would need to see the PowerPoint, but then I could tell you. All right. Let me share my screen back out again. Yeah, with the book. Oh, the book. Okay. So you heard up to that point. Cool. Let me share my screen back out. The um, wealth of knowledge a book has versus what you can find on the internet. All right, cool. And yeah. you cut out like as soon as you finished. Okay. So, um, like I said, I encourage you guys either get the digital copy or the print copy of the book. Um, and speaking of digital copies, our class is enabled with a direct access feature um, from a service called Red Shelf. If you go to the uh, content section of our Blackboard course, um, you click in there, you'll see a bunch of folders. There'll be a folder for our lessons. That's where I'll be putting our PowerPoint slides and um, we'll be using Panapto for video recordings um, of, the, of the course. There's gonna be folders for lab assignments and uh, homework assignments uh, and exams and the final project, which uh, we'll, I'll go through that in a second. But at, at, at the very bottom of that section in the content area, there is a link and instructions for how to set up an account with Red Shelf. You probably got uh, that same email a uh, couple of weeks back before classes started. Uh, but basically, um, until February 6th, you guys have free access to Red Shelf, um, the, our textbook on that digital platform. So you can get the uh, electronic copy of it or get access to the electronic copy of it. But after that, you'll have to make a decision. The free trial ends and you have to make a decision whether or not to purchase. So take advantage of that. If you want to get the digital copy or if you know you want to get print copy, you can always order it from the bookstore if you haven't already. For grading, we're going to be using a point scale. 
uh, thousand points total or uh, as a total amount of points available split up in this way for homework assignments, which are 25 points each. There'll be four of them. So you can get a maximum of hundred points. The labs um, are not necessarily like a paper or something like that. Um, it, the labs are going to take place on Thursdays since we meet twice a week. Uh, Tuesdays are going to act as our lecture day and Thursdays will act as a lab day where we'll have some type of interactive activity that we can go through. Um, that Thursday lab will probably have some lab questions associated with it. And those will be how you earn the points by uh, participating uh, either live in the lab or watching the recording of the lab and then performing the activities on your own to find those answers that you need to uh, answer those lab questions. So there'll be 12 of those type of sessions and an opportunity to earn 25 points from each one of them. The midterm exam, uh, which will cover everything, will include everything uh, that we covered prior to spring break, worth 200 points. Final exam, I'll skip down to that one, worth 300 points, that'll be cumulative. And then the final project, which will be uh, uh, a I'm going to give you a task that basically summarizes a lot of the different things that we're going to do in the labs and a lot of the different things that we're going to discuss throughout the class. So to pull from that, some of that project stuff, you'll you may be able to even, you know, create while you're doing some of these labs. So it's like a work in progress progress throughout the throughout the course. And that's worth 100 points. We're following uh, Taos's uh, usual plus minus grade and scale. So you can see that laid out here. As for the schedule, um, if you go to Blackboard on the information, uh, in the information section, you'll see the schedule laid out there, but everything on the schedule is tentative. Um, there might be some minor date changes, maybe a moving around of an assignment. So I want you, I encourage you to check that regularly. So get in the habit of, habit of doing that. That's what you're going to do if you're not already in the workforce, when you get into the workforce, um, checking your email, checking uh, your resources that you get are given by your employer on a regular basis is part of the job. So get used to it now. Check that Blackboard inform, um, information page to make sure that you're current on any changes. I wouldn't even bother downloading the syllabus. I have a print copy there, but it it'll be changing. So just pay attention to the one that's actually on the screen. All right. Any questions? Of, uh, in, uh, of course, the print copy of the of the um, syllabus has the university's guidance on all of the, the rules and regulations that you, you'll typically see on a syllabus. So that stuff is still intact. Uh, things like late assignments and stuff like that, I'm lenient on. I know people have lives and we're dealing with a bunch of stuff now. So, you know, if you, you slip a week or two on an assignment, I'm not going to, you know, penalize you for that. Just give me notification ahead of time or just give me a heads up. Hey, I'm gonna be late with this assignment. And then more than likely, I'll just be like, okay, cool. Get it in as soon as possible. All right. Any questions about syllabus housekeeping stuff? Yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, so are we meeting just one day a week? Or are we meeting those both days? Well, I, I'm glad you brought up that question. So um, I'm going to launch a poll in a second. Um, I actually teach, like I just mentioned, two sections of this class the uh, in the same format, one hour on Tuesdays and one hour on Thursdays. So I, I had in my mind to make this one uh, asynchronous, uh, but some people like synchronous classes. So I'll put it to you as a class. I'm feeling democratic. So I'm going to launch a poll right now and we'll, I'll get your feedback on how you guys would like each day of the class to be delivered. You want one synchronous, one asynchronous, both synchronous, none synchronous. <laughs>
give you guys another minute or so for folks who for oh it's we're almost done i think it's one more person all right almost a split <laughs> for uh a uh, Tuesday class, but synchronous edged it out a bit. And then we're looking like un asynchronous for Thursdays. All right. Sounds good. Let me write that down. Sounds so good. we'll be in class on Tuesdays and then Thursday you'll post the lecture, yeah. right? And, and unless I'll give you another alternative. I should have probably said this before the poll. As I mentioned, I do teach a section of this same class earlier in the day so i have a i have a recording of this class already from earlier today and also if you're if you don't have a day job or anything i can just give you the link to my day class if you want to take it synchronously and you can hop in the day class so you have some options um but i think we got a, the majority of folks uh looking like they want to do synchronous on tuesdays with that new information, maybe I should launch the poll again. <laughs> See if anybody's thoughts have changed. Sorry to give you this twice. Yeah, one more person. All right. So we're still looking like Tuesdays synchronous. Okay. And Thursdays asynchronous. So we'll be live on we'll be live on Tuesdays for lecture. And then we I'll record the labs so that you can follow along. Uh if I have like a tutorial, uh recording for the lab so you can follow along or at least an instruction sheet for you to follow along with the labs all right sound good to everybody sounds good all right thursday uh professor yes um so someone asked a question in the chat and i guess i have the same question about the tuesday classes Okay. So are those those are you also said that those are recorded too. So if we like can't make it to class, we can just watch those recordings. Yes. Uh, all the classes will be record recorded or have a or either recorded live or have a pre recording like in the in, in the instance of the Thursday classes. Okay. And then say for instance, are we gonna are is it gonna be counted counted against us if we decide to do like Tuesday uh asynchronously or no, no. Is is no attendance great. There's no grade for attendance. In fact, I don't think that the university allows uh, direct attendance grades anymore, uh, at least for nor COVID. All right, so now we got that housekeeping bit taken care of. Let's take a look at this week's topic, which is an overview of systems administration. We'll start off by addressing the, the big question. What is a systems administrator? So somebody in your own words, tell me what you think a systems administrator is. You can come unmute it. Uh, I assume it's a person that oversees like a network and make sure it works properly as intended and then handling any issues that happen on the network. Okay. That that's, Definitely something a sysadmin does. Anybody got anything different? Um, there's also an element of research and development involved, uh, looking for better solutions, newer technologies, how to integrate it into current systems in the network. Um, the goal is to constantly be improving and not just stick with the same stuff you've been using since 1995. Right, awesome. Constantly improving, doing that research to implement newer, better solutions. Somebody give me one, give me one more, one more thing you think uh, a system administrator does is they're part of their job.
Nobody. Uh, can I go again? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, maybe also uh, work with users and make sure that like the systems that they're using, the users actually can access it properly and like know like what the user sees and how they're interacting with it. Exactly, user support. Um, you know, depending on what role you're in as a system administrator, the majority of your job might be user facing. So all of those things that you guys said are correct. And then a whole bunch more um, <laughs> uh, systems administration. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, several jobs in IT are like this, but definitely with systems administration, um, system administration is going to vary, vary from organization from to organization. You might be a systems administrator at, at company A, and your your role might be something like what we're looking at here. With I pulled these from Indeed, just FYI, just went randomly on Indeed and did a search for systems administrator, and these are three that I randomly pulled. But you notice that even though they all have systems administrator or sysadmin in the title, the the roles are pretty pretty diverse. So, for example. This NOC system administrator, NOC stands for Network Operations Center. Their systems administration is focused on maintaining the network, like we heard said a second ago. So they're maintaining routers and switches and networking equipment, making sure people can get access to that and keeps the enterprise, not just the network on premise. That means like in your building, but even your uh, organization's connect uh, connection to cloud resources. They're managing all that. Whereas this IT systems administrator, they're not touching, really touching anything on the network at all. They're primarily concerned with hard system hardware and software, telecommunications equipment, and doing security for IT systems, but they're still a systems administrator. And then this other one, this other systems administrator without the additive to the title, they're doing a mixture of both. They're doing hardware and they're doing networking. They're doing, they're, uh, communicating with with their uh customers or their teams you know when you're an it person everybody's your customer even if they work for the same organization as you because you have to provide that level of service um so they're they've got the human component and they're working with uh networking equipment and computer hardware so even in just that small sampling you see that there's a diversity in what a system administrator actually does but you, there are still some core skills that you can learn, and we're going to be talking about them throughout this course. Um, uh, just kind of FYI on the way that this class is set up. I inherited this class uh, a year, about a year and a half ago from the previous instructor. That's why it, that still has that older book, and it had more of a Linux focus. But in order to be a successful systems administrator because of the diversity of the role, you have to learn a lot. You have to learn about a bunch of different topics. That's why system is, systems administrators are pretty sought after because they know how to work with all of these different systems. So, so what is a system? Let's look at that. So a system can be computer hardware or software or software support. So uh, a server can be a system. A server is like a, it, it can be a high powered computer, like a really beefed up computer, a lot of RAM, a uh, huge amount of storage, 32 CPUs in it, um, but a server doesn't have to be that. A server could be a virtual machine running on your laptop. So if you were building a home lab and you wanted to work with uh, server 2019, like we'll do in this class, you don't need one of these $10,000, $50,000 server computers. You can install a special software on your computer called a hypervisor, which lets you create virtual machines. And then you can install Windows 2016 or Windows 2019 server edition on your on your laptop and now your laptop's a server because really what makes a server a server is the operating system the software that it's running can that software provide services to users who connect into it um will now will your laptop run <laughs> run like that enterprise server not a chance but because it still has the tools necessary to provide services to uh, you know a group of users, it still will be considered a server. So there's that software aspect in addition to the hardware. You guys, I know you know about desktops and laptops. There are systems administrators who specialize in desktop and laptop management. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, when I, I used to work for LifeBridge Health for my folks who are in Maryland, 
They're a one of the one of the big hospital sy- uh, systems in Maryland. Uh, and I was at one of their locations, Sinai Hospital. And there I was their enterprise desktop administrator. So typically, you know, desk side support folks, they they do desk side support. They go to your desk and they support you. They troubleshoot your individual computer. They help you set up your printer, things like that. Well, with enterprise, but that uh, with that approach, these computers are like standalone. And if you have thousands of machines, it's impractical to do that alone. You need some type of centralized management. Having devices on a network gives you the ability to have that centralized management over those desktops and laptops if you have the right software. So part of my job there was to manage from a organizational perspective, all of the desktops and laptops and mobile devices for the whole hospital. So I had to learn some special software tools and actually I helped implement those software tools too as in my role as a system administrator there to actually manage all of the, all of the computers at the hospital system, you know, from a single pane of glass. That means from a single machine, I could issue commands to all of the systems in the hospital. All right. So that even that is a way of managing different systems. Those systems can, can uh, operate individually, but as a sysadmin, you're typically not managing one system. You're managing, you know, tens or thousands of systems at once. Same thing with mobile devices. Mobile devices are, are becoming common fixtures on even on enterprise networks. Now, you know, companies issue, smartphones to their to their employees or they provide resources so that the person can put company information on their personal devices Um, but that needs to be managed that was part of my job at pearson i did mobile device management and security Uh, pearson again a global company headquarters in london but i was working with the north america north american division and they had a mission that by 2020 they wanted all of the employees around the world to be able to work from any device anytime uh, from any location so and part of that was you know an employee should be able to pick up their smartphone and have the same user experience on their smartphone as they did on that on their laptop in order to do that though you have to have some level of management over that smartphone the same way you have management over that laptop so we had to implement tools in order to remotely manage people's mobile devices that might have been on the other side of the world so even those mobile device constitute systems and as an administrator again you 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 might manage them as one-offs but more than likely you're going to be managing them in groups systems however can also be networking so like we saw that knock system administrate system administrator Networking hardware and software and support all fall under that idea of systems so routers You know, those devices that are the backbone of the Internet allow your network to connect to somebody else's network on the other side of the globe. They need to be managed and maintained and even set up (laughs) to begin with. Modems, think old school dial up Internet, allow your devices to connect to the public switch telephone network or POTS. Sometimes we call it plain old telephone service. Uh, Bridges and repeaters are older devices, but they serve some of the same purposes as routers and another device here called a switch. But all of these network pieces of network infrastructure, they all need to be managed. They they in most cases have their own operating systems on them. Um, That might be just command line. They produce uh, important information that you might need to harvest from them in order to make decisions on uh, security related decisions or performance related decisions. So as, as an admin, you might be responsible for managing those same thing with the firewalls. There's a wealth of information there. Plus they need to be set up and can, and configured and maintain shared resources like printers, fax machines and storage area networks, same thing. And then even thing like things like managing the cabling, the actual physical connectivity between devices. Um, could fall in your purview as a systems administrator. And beyond all of the technical stuff that we just talked about, there's that human aspect that uh, I remember somebody mentioning when we were, when we were uh, talking about what a systems administrator was. Users, ultimately all of the stuff that you do, you're doing is to support users. So 
non-physical things that you'll have to do. You have to set up user accounts. You might be involved in a user onboarding process. That means bringing somebody into the organization, all of the steps that need to be done to bring them into the organizations. Uh, IT folks, your systems administrator play uh, an important role in that because more than likely you're going to be the one who is getting them all of the access they need in order to do their job. You know, they come on as an HR person. They're going to need access to these files and they're going to need to be able to get to this printer and they're going to need to be able to get uh, to this uh, cloud account to get to this SharePoint website, internal website. So they're going to need all these resources. And as a sysadmin, you hold the keys of the kingdom, as they say. You, you have the level of authority on that corporate network to make that type of stuff happen for them. So they'll be, they're going to be looking, looking to you to support that user. And when we support those users, we typically don't do it as one-offs. We support users in groups. That's kind of just a best practice for systems administration. You'll also be responsible for protecting the intellectual property of the organization. Uh, intellectual property is that, that uh, information that is so important or so critical to the company that the loss of it could put them out of business. Think about like KFC. You know how, I don't know if anybody know about KFC's secret recipe. There are 11 herbs and spices. No. Yeah, that, they, they, used to, they used to tout it a lot. That used to be like their big thing. We got this secret blend of 11 herbs and spices. That's their proprietary information. Coca-Cola, the same thing. Oh, sorry, their, their intellectual property, which is proprietary information. Um, Coca-Cola is the same way. Coca-Cola has a secret recipe that they've been keeping secret for over a hundred years. That's their intellectual property. If that secret ever got out, it could be the loss of billions of dollars for them if somebody could replicate their product exactly. Or let's say bring it more modern. Let's say the new iPhone is about to come out and then somebody leaks the information about the new details of it and the new specs and all that stuff. That's intellectual property. As a sysadmin, you're going to be the one responsible for managing the, the technology where that data is stored. So again, big responsibility, policies and authority structures, you'll help set up and implement those. Policies don't typically come from a sysadmin. They usually come from somebody on high, a CISO, a CIO, some type of executive. But when the executive says, you know, Nobody in the company is allowed to go to Facebook on their work computer. Yeah, the CISO said it, and maybe even they wrote it down in a, uh, a document somewhere, but that doesn't enforce it on the computer. It's you as a systems administrator. You're going to play a role in making and turning that policy, those words that the C CIO said or wrote down, you're going to turn that into an actual technical solution that will enforce what they're saying uh, in their policy documents. And then logs and help desk mentioned before all of these different systems, the computers, the, the network infrastructure devices, even the actual software applications that you set up on those systems, those physical systems. They're all producing information. They're collecting tons and tons of data in a form of these text logs and the text logs. Sometimes they're super hard to read. You, you might not even be able to read them unless you just specialize in that that hardware or software. So in order to uh, kind of help out with that, we use these things called log aggregators. We're going to talk about those more. We actually have a lab where we'll be looking at two of the really, really top ones. One of them one of them's open source and one of them, um, we're going to play around with a free trial. But both of them are able to take those logs and correlate them, match them up. So I got a log from over here and for the same time period, a log from this other device and it can correlate them and let me run queries against them almost like a database and it'll spit me back a report or information that'll help me make decisions on how to fine-tune performance of a system or maybe how to troubleshoot a security issue or maybe even make me aware that there a security issue occurred so this helps reduce the human overhead uh, with some of your other systems but it's still not actually a technology it's just another piece of non-physical information that you have to be the one to ingest as a systems administrator. All right, so that's a lot of the technical stuff that you need to be aware of. Also, 
you need to be aware that the size of your organization is going to determine what type of what your systems administration job or experience is going to be like. So, for example, in a small network or organization with, you know, less than 100 users, the systems administrator role is going to look a lot different than the systems administrator role in a large organization. So let's look at this small organization. You know, you got a, let's say um, a tax office, H&R Block, something like that. You know how they set up those little uh, temporary, um, you know, tax facilities for the tax season. And then they shut them down like right after April, April ends. That place might only have like five people working in it. That's a small network. With that type of network, you need to be a jack of all trades because more than likely, as the systems administrator, you're also the telecom person. You're also the DESI support person and the network person and everything else technical that possibly they might call you to fix the coffee machine because you're the only one in the building who has some type of technical expertise. So you got to you got to be on your game if you're working in a small network because you need to know at least a little bit a lot of, about a lot of things. Um, this is actually a good environment, though. It can be stressful at times because, again, you're getting random stuff thrown at you like every day. But it also gives you the chance to develop a very broad uh, set of skills because you're going to get the opportunity to touch different technologies uh, all the time. Like I said, you might have never thought of, uh, you know, learning how to program a phone, a voice over IP phone. But because you're the only technical person there, that project is going to land in your lap. And your project might not only be that your involvement in that project might not just be, you know, the actual technical stuff you might be tasked with actually doing the research and all the business side of that project too. So now, not only did you increase your uh, technical skill set, you got some business experience that you can put on your resume. You researched, uh, you did uh, market research on several different companies to find the best pricing. You negotiated with that company that you end up choosing to see what types of services and features you were going to get on these devices or this or this service you led their engineers or you led the charge yourself and actually rolling out the devices implemented implementing it and you and you basically and at the end of it you got your users set up on that new technology you took that project from start to end you're not at that point you're not just a systems administrator you're a marketing person you're a uh, <laughs> um uh what's the word a project manager so think about all those skill sets that you just developed that you can now put on your resume. And then when you decide to move on to your next, your next gig, now you can say you did all of these things. Um, because IT folks don't stay put, put uh, very long. Uh, we typically move jobs, especially early in the careers, between uh, you know every six months to maybe two years max. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Mohammed, learn how to use, how to fix coffee machines as well especially the ones now, because think about coffee machines now. Are they just coffee machines? Nah, they're IoT devices. <laughs> they connect to the network. <laughs> All right, um, medium-sized networks. With the, these are going to be your networks between 100 and 250 people. Uh, in this type of network, it might, it might not just be you. You might not be the only IT person there. More than likely, you're going to have a small team. So you don't have to be absolutely the jack of all trades, but you should have two or three things that you that you're good at, because that's going to be like your your lane on that team. Uh, for example, when I was doing the consultant work with with uh, Opus Inspection, we that was a even though they had a big, big um, state contract there, they were a, we were a small team. So we had a guy who, spe- who was a he was a developer. All he did was write code. We had a, a, a lady who did configuration management. So she she managed access to the applications he was he was writing. My role was to do system and network administration for them. So I managed the servers and the networking equipment and the telecom stuff. We have field engineers who actually went out 
and did field tech stuff. They, they went out to the sites to actually do like death side support at the different facilities around the state. Um, so everybody kind of had their role. Um, we each had to know maybe two or three different things, but we were still working in this small group environment. Now, at the end of the, the, the extreme of this kind of size matters thing is large networks. So this is your, you know, your Northrop Grumman's, your Lockheed Martin's, your Raytheon's, your Department of Defense, NSA. These organizations are huge, 250 plus users. And in those type of environments, they since they're so large, they have large IT teams or large technical staffs. Um, when a when the staff of an IT team is that big, uh, you can start to identify people who are who can be specialists, so that all they do is worry about a certain type of technology. That way, they can get really deep into it and become experts at that particular technology. This is great if you know exactly what you want to do in technology, like you know you want to be a cloud systems administrator, and that's all you want to do. All you want to do is be a Linux system administrator perfect role because in these large organizations you get to just get better and better and better at that thing that you do um the flip side of that is in these large organizations because the roles are so siloed you won't really get a chance to touch somebody uh, another type of technology so like let's say you were that cloud you becoming that cloud guru cloud systems administrator but you, you still like to learn new stuff so you want to learn a little about a little bit about cybersecurity. The cybersecurity folks ain't letting you come in their lane. They're like, no, you're the cloud guy. You stay, you kind of stay over there. <laughs> Go study on your own time. You can't touch our systems. Pe uh, in big organizations, people get very um, possessive about their systems. That's how it was when I worked with Pearson. <laughs> uh, Pearson, global, global uh, um, organization, 100,000 users around the globe. I was on their, their global systems administration team. And the systems admin team was so big that it had smaller systems admin teams inside of it. <laughs> so you had one big overarching systems administration team, but then you had systems administrators specifically who service students because uh, they have an educational, a higher education and a K through 12 education. So actually they had a K through 12 education systems administration team and a separate higher education systems administration team. They had a global systems administration team that handled um, architecting new solutions. They had the ones who actually man managed solutions. Um, I was on the team that actually architected solutions. So what we would do is we were quasi business analysts. We would meet with different departments, find out what their business processes were, how they did, how they did their day to day. Um, and if their day to day was not automated enough, we would figure out ways to streamline their work by uh, researching and implementing technology solutions. We get their input, find out what the requirements were to get their job done or that whatever task they were trying to get done. Look to see if there's a solution existed that could potentially do it. Get a demo of it, build out a, build out a demo of it, demonstrate it to them and have them tested to see if it worked for their solution. And if it did, we would have them purchase it and then we would, we would uh, set it, get it all set up and then hand it over to them. And then we and then we would hand it over to that other team to actually run the day to day of managing those solutions. Um, <clears throat> so, again, large organizations, you're going to get very specialized and it has its downsides. Like, for example, as far as job flexibility goes. The experience that you get from working on a small network, but being that jack of all trades makes you very mobile, right? Because let's say you're you, you're working at that organization, they have databases. So you had to learn a little bit about database administration, database systems administration, and but you really like it. So now you pick up a little bit of skills, maybe you go get a cert, a certification in database to get go along with all the other certifications that you have as, as a sysadmin. And then you say, you know what? I'm ready to go look for another gig somewhere else. You can now step off and maybe get a, a, you know, a junior level or maybe a level one database administrator job because of the skill set you picked up as a sysadmin working for that small company. And then if you know a little bit about this, a little bit about that, it makes you more mobile. 
you can hop into different roles and different, even, even different industries. Like I've worked in the private sector, public sector, um, uh, nonprofit space, totally different industries, but they all need IT people. So it makes you mobile. Whereas with a specialist, you're not as mobile, right? Because you specialize in this one thing. So there's not going to be as many jobs, job openings for that one specific thing that you specialize in. Well, in c- compared to the overall number of IT jobs open. But when you do get picked up by an organization for your specialty, that's when you're seeing salaries of like, you know, $150,000, $200,000 a year because you're an expert. And, people, and organizations pay for expertise. So you, you kind of look at it from both ways. It's almost like uh, in the medical field, you have, people, you have two doctors, but one doctor is like an emergency room doctor and the other doctor is a brain surgeon. They're both doctors, but I guarantee you that brain surgeon makes a lot more money because he's a specialist. But I also guarantee you that that other doctor is more mobile. He can go work for any hospital he wants because he has a base skill set that can be taken anywhere. Everybody, every hospital needs an emergency or has an emergency room, but not every hospital has a top notch uh, brain surgery unit that'll be willing to pay, you know, Dr. B over here, whatever he, whatever salary he's asking for. <clears throat> so I, I like to play the middle, become a specialist in, in two or three different things. Like my specialty is cybersecurity, systems administration, and network administration. So I can get a good job that pays. You know, if I go back into the field full time, I can get a good job that pays well above a hundred thousand. But at the same time, I can work in three different areas, three different disciplines. All right. So some of the duties of a systems administrator. We talked about how diverse it is systems administration is but when you start looking at the core duties you'll see that there's some overlap there for example all systems administrators are going to be somehow involved in account provisioning whether they're the ones architecting the systems or just managing them you're going to be creating accounts for people they could like, like user accounts hardware maintenance is important knowing how to get into a device and you know fix it if it's working or, or maintain it keep it up and running uh, system backups, probably one of the more boring things that you do as a systems administrator, but super critical because system backups will bail you out in emergency situations. Um, and if you don't have if you don't have uh, valid backups and you're the systems administrator, one of my one of my professors undergrad used to put it like this. He said that's a resume generating uh, situation because you if you if that happens to you and you're the one who was supposed to be doing those backups and company gets hacked ransomware, something like that. And they're going to be relying on those backups. So they don't have to pay that ransom. And then you go to test your backups and they don't work or even worse. You don't have the backups at all. You're the first one on the chopping block. So even though it's boring, you got to learn how to do those system backups, but it's ways that we can automate those. And we'll talk about that. Um, Software installation and maintenance system monitoring and security. This one is kind of important because not all organizations have a dedicated security team. So in that instance, your company doesn't have a security department, then it typically falls on the systems administrators or maybe the systems and the network administrators to provide all the security coverage from a technical perspective. So you'll play a role in that. And then troubleshooting and firefighting, like I mentioned this uh, with the events earlier. Uh, today um, at Towson. The systems admins had to go in firefighter mode. They had an issue that needed to be resolved immediately. And a lot of times it falls on a systems administrator. Like they're the first ones they go to, uh, first ones we go to, maybe the network folks, uh, but first ones you go to when there's an issue. Like think about like your, if you got a Microsoft computer, like Windows 10, when your Windows 10 machine has an error message, you'll probably get an error message that says something like, the error occurred when such and such happened. Um, if it occurs again, please contact your systems administrator. <laughs> so firefighters. <laughs> yes, sysadmins are all over the place. You might hear them by different titles though. IT is really weird about titles. They might call it um, 
you know, a systems analyst. They might call it a systems engineer, uh, systems, systems administrator, uh, customer support uh, administrator. So it'll be weird titles, but that's why you have to, if in a job postings, you have to actually read through what the day-to-day is for that role. And if it says anything about the stuff that's listed here, you're a systems administrator. You might just have different levels. Um, in a typical setup, there's a there's a three tiers to systems administration. Your level one systems administrators uh, usually are customer facing. They're the ones dealing directly with uh, you know users. They might even be on the phones. They're the ones getting that first line fr- phone call, creating tickets, stuff like that, almost like a help desk, but a little bit higher because they they have access to servers and they can make uh, changes on at the network level, not just at an individual user level. Then you have your tier two systems administrators. They might, they're a little bit more seasoned. Um, they, they might manage entire applications or subsets of servers, but they're doing it under the supervision of a tier three, which is a senior level systems administrator who that, they might actually be architects. So system architects. So that, like I said, that was when I was a senior sys uh, admin and then later a senior systems analyst. Part of my job wasn't just managing the systems, it was actually building them in the first place. So you're definitely going to see them all over the place because every organization uses software and uses hardware. And like, like I said in the course description, they need some, if, if company A is using this software, is, that software is not going to run, run successfully or run correctly without having issues for the re- from the time you install it for the rest of its lifetime. And then even if it does run, you know, without issue for, you know, several years, there's going to be a point when that software goes out of date and needs to be replaced. Who, who you call? You call the sister admins. Um, in addition to the size of your organization, the operating system is also going to matter. Um, Linux is a big one. But Windows is actually still bigger, even on the server side. That's why I wanted to incorporate it into this class when I begin revamping things. Um, Windows, the kind of key difference between Windows and at the server, um, in the server realm, is that Windows typically, even though it's uh, being implemented as a server, still usually uses its GUI um, interface, its graphical user interface. Um, So it still has the icons and its point and click because the goal is to kind of make it very familiar to you. If you've been using Windows on your desktop or laptop, it makes it an easy visual transition to go to Windows Server because it's kind of set up the same way, just has different tools in it. Problem with the GUI though, is that it uses up a lot of, lot of resources unnecessarily, especially on a server, because nine times out of 10, you won't be logging directly into a server. The server will be providing some type of resource for another system. Like that server might be the back end database for a website. So you log into the website, you never actually directly access the server. So why do I need a GUI on it? So even, even though Windows kind of is more GUI oriented, they do have a way of setting it up where it's command line uh, only to save on those resources. Linux go- takes a different approach. Linux is natively like we're command line. But now they're offering a GUI, too, um, on a lot of their um, different distributions to make it easier for people who are coming from the Windows world. Linux has a much bigger footprint on the server side than it does on the on the um, desktop and laptop side, the, and the client computer side. You know, client on the client side, unless you're like an IT, IT people like us, you might not even heard of Linux before. <clears throat> but. On a server side, probably if there were 10 servers in an organization, two of them would probably be Linux. So that's maybe three. So that's a much bigger footprint. And then a lot of the appliances. So an appliance is like a specialized server. So think about if an organization wants to get a firewall, they could, they could get a firewall uh, to filter network traffic. They can get a firewall software and then install it on the server, or they can go out and get a firewall appliance which is a separate tool, a separate device that they install in their data center and that acts as the filter for the network traffic. Nine times out of 10, those appliances, in order to save on licensing, the the appliance manufacturer 
will go with a Linux derivative because Linux is open source. They'll take a version of Linux, tweak it to their specifications, install it as the OS on their device and run it. So Linux, learning your way around Linux comes in real handy because you'll, you'll find that on enterprise networks, there's a lot of appliances, different appliances, different tools that vendors have used and they all might have slightly different operating systems, but they all understand Linux command line. So if you can get in the Linux command line, you can manipulate a lot of those different tools and extract information and configure them and do all that cool stuff. Um, uh, and then we have Unix. Unix is the granddaddy of, of Linux and also of Mac OS. They're both based off of the Unix operating system, but it still operates as its standalone operating system in two versions. Solaris and AIX. So you need to be familiar with these different OSs because like, like I mentioned before, it's the OS that makes the uh, makes makes it a server, not so much the hardware. And then finally, I kind of talked about this a second ago, command line. So the command line is cool because you can get into the command line and execute commands that uh, might take, you know, this one line, this one short command might uh, perform the equivalent of clicking around five different icons in the GUI. So I can get back information or change configurations, you know, with a short command uh, versus clicking it all over the place in the GUI in order to make that same task happen. Um, but in addition to that, the command line allows you to automate things. As a systems administrator, you're going to be looking to automate as much as you can because automation removes the human element. Going back to those backups, right? Let's say I, I work in an organization that requires backups to be done at like three o'clock in the morning every day because they want to make sure that absolutely nobody is on the line act on the um, online accesses accessing systems when those backups are occurring. So 3 a.m. every day, seven days a week backups need to happen well i'm a human being if i'm the one responsible for doing those backups more than likely i'm gonna miss one of those because i'm not gonna stay up to three o'clock at 3 a.m every morning especially if i'm doing work during the day too um so it's kind of impractical to think that that's going to happen manually somebody's manually going to kick that off so instead what you can do is you can use the scripting abilities of your operating systems. All of those different operating systems we looked at all have command lines, which means they all have the ability to write scripts, little short programs that automate tasks that can then be scheduled on your operating system, Linux or Windows or Unix. Um, to do that, to write those commands, all you need is a text editor, a simple program that can record text, uh, create text documents. In Windows, we have Notepad. But in Linux, they have uh, VI and Nano and a bunch of other ones. These are inline text editors. You don't even have to leave the command line in order to launch them. You just type in the command VI, and then it opens up a text editor right in the command line. And then you create your text, your, um, your script, and save it. And then you set it as a cron job so that it'll, it'll run on a schedule. And then you can set it and forget it. And it removes that human element um, so that... Uh, you don't really have to worry about, oh, did the person miss that three o'clock, you know, backup is on a schedule. As long as the system's up and running, the three o'clock backup is going to happen. All right. So that's another big thing that that we'll take a look at that that aspect of systems administration as well. All right. And then that is it for today. Um, are there any questions about anything that we went over? No questions. Cool. All right. If no questions is the word for everybody, then we are done for the day. Look, look forward to getting a recording of the lab for Thursday's class. And I will see you guys next Tuesday.